All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started on unit, or I'm sorry, lecture two of this unit. We start talking about uh, the unique Earth. We've had a chance to talk about how the universe began. Now let's be a little bit more specific. So the first thing I want to talk about is how do we prove the Earth is round? It seems so simple. We take it for granted. We know, in fact, the Earth is round. But what are the proofs of the Earth being round? Now, granted, the number one proof is you yeah, jump in a spaceship, you go out in outer space, you can see it's round. We have a lot of satellite imagery. But what about four satellites? And I'll go over some of the proof that we've we've kind of come up with. First, you stand on the beach, you watch a ship go out to sea, and it will slowly disappear over the horizon, proving that the, the Earth is curved, and from that you can sort of deduct that the Earth must be round. Bah! And, then, and of course, this is a Worthing original drawing. I had to put a shark in there. You know I had to. Um, let's see. Another proof we have. Looking up at the nighttime sky. There's something up there that's going to really help us prove the Earth is, is in fact round. And what it is is this star. Let's see if I can get my pointer out here. This star right here. Polaris. Also known as the North Star. And I'm going to show you a couple of clicks, a uh, couple of uh, images here of how we find it. The easiest way, this is the way I'll teach you. So you find the Big Dipper, that's down here, right? Here's the handle. Here's the Dipper. It's kind of like a, a a pop. You line up these two stars at the end, go straight out. You will find the North Star or Polaris. Here's a little thing showing how you do it. You find those two. Draw a straight line. There it is. And Polaris just happens to be the tail end of the Little Dipper, which is hanging upside down. And kind of a point of reference, if you get to this this uh, W-shaped constellation called Cassiopeia, you've gone too far. You need to go back. So I'll give you a little homework assignment tonight. See if you could find, um, or over the weekend, see if you could find the star. OK, so the reason this is important and, and I guess maybe a little bit more information about it before I really get into what's important is if this is, let's see, if this right here is the North Star, the way it sort of works it is the Earth is it's no, our North Pole. I could draw this well, maybe. It pointed right directly at the North Star. Sorry about that. Here's our equator. Uh, that's why we call it the North Star. It's directly over the North Pole. If you were standing on the North Pole, the, the North Star would be at a 90 degree angle to the horizon. Or in other words, right over your head. Now we're not there. We're, we're more halfway in between the equator and the North Pole. There's Fairhaven High School. So it's not going to be directly over our head. It's going to be at the latitude we exist at, which is about 43, 44 degrees. We'll get into that in a little more detail. But here's something I want to show you really quick, just kind of a side note. As the world turns, as the Earth spins, say it's spinning this way, and you look up at the night sky and you see Polaris right there, Polaris will not appear to move because it's right over um, our axis where we're spinning. All the other stars out here will appear, appear to move. They'll look like they're moving in a circle around Polaris, Really, that's just the same, or caused by the movement of the Earth. I'll show you a picture of this. If you take a um, a camera and you open up the shutter on the camera and point it at the North Star and leave it open for several hours, you'll get this very cool picture right here. The North Star is right there in that area. Whoops, let me go back. It's right there in that area there. And all these other stars are going in a circle around it or at least they appear that way. What's really happening is the Earth is spinning and that causes all the stars to appear like they're spinning. But that's not really proof of, of the Earth being round. Here's how we use the uh, the North Pole to show that the Earth's round. If you, here you are on your bike with a very nice green backpack and a red helmet and you're hanging out on the equator and you go ride this, this road that goes from the equator to the North Pole and you have a very nice bell. As you move to 15 degrees latitude, 
here's the North Star. It went from being right on the horizon to being, if you were to take a measurement, 15 degrees from the horizon up into the sky. As we continue, you get to 30. There it is at a 30 degree angle from you, the horizon, up to the North Star. And we can keep going. We'll get up to about where we live, 45 degrees. So you're going to see it at a 45 degree angle up in the sky. Six degrees. Now you'll notice, oh look at, you have nice um, pink gloves and white earmuffs. You'll notice as you get closer to the equator, the higher up the North Star goes. We get to the North Pole and it would be directly overhead. Now as you start traveling away from the North Pole, you start to see it come back down until you got to the equator on the other side of the Earth showing that the Earth is curved. So that's proving curvature of, of the Earth. All right? Uh, another, so that's, that's proof number two. One is the ship going over the horizon. The other one is uh, looking at the North Pole and moving from the equator to the, to the um, North Pole. I'm sorry, the North Star and moving from the equator to the North Pole. And you can see from the movement of that star in the sky that the Earth has curvature. Uh, another way is lunar eclipse. That's when the Earth comes in between the sun and the moon. And what happens is you can see right through here the curvature of the Earth based on the shadow we cast on the moon. I'll show you kind of a cool image of this. Um, I'm gonna, this is a really fun thing to play around with. I'll put a website on here so you can see it. This is a solar eclipse. That's the one you don't want to look at. I want to bring the moon way over here. And as the moon comes into a lunar eclipse, take a look up here. You'll see the Earth's shadow, and you can see, there it is, the Earth is curved, indicating that we are round. All right? Like I said, I'll give you the website on this, and you can, you can see the curve coming back out of the shadow. You guys can play around with this. It's actually a really fun program. So a lunar eclipse is another way we can prove it. Ultimately, ships gradually uh, disappear below the horizon. Polaris changes in altitude as you change your latitude. Uh, lunar eclipses show the shadow of a curved Earth. Absolute proof, satellite imagery. The next thing I think I want to talk about here is what's the shape of the Earth? Is it perfectly round? And the answer is, of course it's not. It's not quite this lumpy, but it's not perfectly round. It's a uh, it's described as an oblate spheroid, which, which simply means, instead of being perfectly round, it's like a basketball where you push on the top and bottom, and meet, that makes the, uh, the poles, the top and bottom, squish down, and the equator bulge out. That's an oblate spheroid. And how do we prove that? This guy, the guy with the funny hairdo, that is Isaac Newton, right? And by, uh, he, he basically came up with the idea of gravity, and that's, that's how we prove it, gravity. If you someday come up with gravity, you can walk around with a hairdo like that. Here's what Newton basically said, that gravity, I can write that, is based on two things. How big an object is, that versus say this. The bigger the object, the more gravity it has. That's why when we go on the moon and you see astronomers, um, I'm sorry, uh, astronauts walking and jumping, they can jump much higher. There's less gravity pulling them back to the moon than the Earth has. All right, so one is the size, the mass of the object determines gravity. And two is the distance between the objects from point A to point B. So if I had another object out here of the same mass, I see B is going to be pulled in by this very massive planet with more gravity than C is. All right, so the further away you get from the source of gravity, the less it pulls on you. So those are two things uh, with gravity. Now, this is a really cool, I love these things. This is called a gravity well. This is done by a, a cartoonist um, that's actually quite funny. I think I had to edit this just a little bit. Hopefully, they'll they'll forgive me for messing with their cartoon. But it's 
These are gravity wells. And if you take it here, I'm going to zoom in on some of these. It's basically showing how different planets, like Jupiter, look at Jupiter, it's huge. Um, it means it has a lot of gravity. And we can represent that by drawing these fake wells. And if you stood down in the well, all right, how much force would you have to jump up with to escape the gravity of Jupiter? Here, a lot. Whereas some other planets, like Venus, you wouldn't have to jump with as much force to escape. And so this is just a way of representing how gravity behaves. Check these ones out right here. These, these um, where we have uh, two different moons of Mars. They're so small that their gravity is, is tiny, teeny tiny. You could escape this moon if you had a, a nice bike and a ramp. You could jump off that ramp with enough force to escape the gravity of that moon. It's pretty cool. So, um, we understand gravity. How do we use it to basically demonstrate that the Earth is not perfect around? And here's how we do it. If you are standing at the North Pole or the South Pole, because of the bulge that, remember I compared it to a ball where you squeeze the top and bottom of the ball, you'd be closer to the center of the Earth. The closer you are to the center of gravity, the more gravity pulls on you. So you'd have a greater gravitational pull on your body at the North and South Pole compared to the bulging part of the Earth where you're bulging away from the center of the Earth, that'd be the equator, you would have a less of a gravitational pull on your body there. So weight, when you step on a bathroom scale, your weight is actually a measurement of two things, how massive you are and how much gravity is pulling on you. This is why when you um, go to the moon, you weigh less. Your mass stays the same, but you weigh less because there's not as much gravity pulling on you on the moon. Now back on Earth, if you're on the North or South Pole, you'd be closer to the center of the Earth. The gravity would be a little bit greater, so you would weigh more. If you stood on the equator, where you're bulging away from the center of the Earth because of the shape of the Earth, you would weigh less. It wouldn't be much, but enough where we can measure it with some, some good instruments. Um, to give you some details of the difference between the bulging equator and the North and South Pole, here are some, some circumferences. The equator and the prime meridian is just going from North Pole to South Pole. Not much of a difference, but enough where we can measure the gravity and see a little difference and prove the shape of the Earth. Go back to ancient Greece. If we want to talk about the, the circumference of the Earth, how do we know how big the Earth is? The, uh, today it's much easier to calculate it. We can calculate it very precisely. The first person to calculate it accurately was Eratosthenes, a librarian in ancient Greece, and what he did is on, um, let's see, it was the spring equinox, I believe, where he was in these two towns, well he was in one town and had someone else helping him in another town, and he noticed on the spring equinox in Syene, the sun was perfectly overhead, and so when you look down a well, it cast no shadow. But in Alexandria, which was a little further north, the sun was not perfectly overhead, and when it hit this, this needle here, this obelisk, it cast a shadow. Uh, there's the obelisk that he used, and they actually picked this up back in the 1880s, I think, and moved it to Central Park, yeah, 1881. There it is, so someday maybe you guys will go and see that. And here's the math behind it. If you take a look right here, in Syene, there was no shadow, so the sun's angle was perfectly straight down. In Alexandria, there was a shadow, meaning the sun was not coming straight down. Using a little bit of uh, geometry, he was able, Eratosthenes, was able to calculate um, the angle between, if you drew straight lines to the center of the earth, the angle between uh, Alexandria and Syene. Okay? And he knew the distance between these two towns, so, and he was assuming that the Earth was round, so he calculated the angle here to be seven and a half degrees. So if you wanted to make it to 360, how many of these little triangles would you need? All right? And what he found was 
that he would need about 50 of those triangles to equal 360 degrees. If he knew the distance between Alexandria and Syene, he could just multiply that by 50, and he would get uh, a circumference. Back then, they used a different measurement. They had stadiums, so they measured things in a stadium or a stadii. 240,000 stadia is what he calculated, which we know today to be, um, if we converted that, 39,250 kilometers, or in miles, 40,070. I'm sorry, in miles, um, I don't have that here. Let's see if I can. Here. Let me see if I can pop that up for you. Okay, there we go. So we have a pretty, um, a very accurate calculation. And I want you guys to see if you can figure out the percent uh, deviation, meaning how far off was he from what we truly know today. And that's where I'm going to stop for the day.